across the Atlantic, past the Vistula River. There is an ancient and mysterious land, a land that for generations has guarded the powerful secrets of the crow. On the shores of eastern Prussia, on the coast of the Kurian Spit, a fisherman stands before the salty gales blowing in from the Baltic Sea. Staring into the black eyes of a crow, he aims his widened mouth and bites into the creature's skull. These are the crow biters. But first, backstory. The Korean Spit is a beautiful land of romance, moose, crow consumption, and oppressive sand dunes that came into existence eons ago through the love of the giantess Naringa. She loved the local fishermen and was tired of having them die in storms, so she picked up a bunch of sand in her apron and dumped it out into the ocean until the spit had formed. Or it was created six, seven thousand years ago due to glacial movements, sea tides, powerful winds, and human activity. Evidence could go either way, honestly. Measuring 61 miles across, or 98 kilometers for those of y'all who don't love freedom, the peninsula shields eastern Prussia and Lithuania's coast from the Baltic Sea, creating the gorgeous Coronian Lagoon. Long ago, before war was raged by sand dunes, the area was totally covered in forest. The spit was a haven for a buttload of wildlife, especially for birds, including the crow. Wow, that's a lot of birds! Wow, that's a lot of birds! Holy shit, so many birds! The earliest evidence suggests the people of the region all the way back in ancient history were able to live off the land pretty well. There was a good amount of fishing here to be done when the sea allowed, and the forest had plenty of food to forage and hunt. The next mention of people living in the spit would come from a one-off mention in a Roman source. This one, I didn't look it up right now. Back then, shit was ballin' out here thanks to that kick-ass amber trade. Romans loved to get them some amber. A couple hundred years later, the Romans felt that they needed to condescendingly let the locals know just how amber was made. You know, since they're clearly better than everyone. Dicks. Fast forward to around the year 800-ish, and we find some Swedish merchant colonies out here that are thriving medieval trading centers. Shortly after their establishment, though, Harold Bluetooth's son comes by and kills everyone. Now, it takes another 400 years for the region to really start popping off again. It's then that the Teutonic Knights have decided that the Prussians and people living around them need to either meet Jesus or meet the blade. So they start crusading, and soon they're building castles out all along the spit. They would hold on to power in the region until the Polish Teutonic Wars. After this is when we start to get in a bit of multicultural history. From the 16th century onwards, Koronians, Lithuanians, and Germans inhabited the spit together. The land was subject to numerous nations. It was about this point in the early 1700s that the area becomes a brutal place to live. Famine wipes out up to one-fourth of the region. Then, several decades later, the Seven Years' War breaks out, and the Prussians need a lot of wood for all their ships, so I hope you don't mind a bit of deforestation. Now with no forest to hold back the dunes, their growth and attack begins. Horse carriages are engulfed by quicksand. Entire villages meet their ends thanks to the Great Dune Ridge. There are even cases of whole villages being destroyed by the Great Dune Ridge and rebuilt only to be destroyed once again nine years later. In total, at least 14 whole villages were wiped out by the mighty dunes. This poem really sets the mood for how life in the region was. God forgot us. Let us perish. His empty house you will now inherit. You will be able to play with the cross in the Bible. Go, Mom. Bury us. Wrap us quietly in the shroud of death. Blessings are ours. Mistakes are our curses. Look, we are lying dead, and the dunes have came and covered them. All right, well, that was brutal. Obviously, the dunes had left a traumatic imprint on the Coronians. With little force left to provide the food that they needed to survive, malnutrition begins to set in quick, causing high rates of tuberculosis. 
Thankfully though, people do realize the cut down trees need to be replaced, so life here just isn't shit anymore. But those trees still have time to grow, and you need food now. It's not summer when you can go out and fish, and it's not winter when the lagoon's ice is thick enough to walk out and fish on. So during the melting of spring and the storms of autumn, you only have your dune-ravaged land to turn to for food. You turn to the crow. Other sources say the Corlands, fleeing from attacking Swedes, sought refuge in the Spit around the 17th century, and they brought over the practice of crow eating with them. Other sources claim Lithuanian aristocracy on lavish parks during the 19th century, that crows shat all over, and out of revenge, the nobles hunted them all down, and that's where crow eating comes from. Then there are other sources that claim there were crow taxes back in the early 1500s. I can't find anything about any of these sources, so Lithuanians, let me know. Or actually just keep watching, because of course, in the last hours of editing, I find this. And for all those of you who don't speak Lithuanian, allow me to explain what it says. See, back in the early 1700s, the Prussian government was in control of the spit at the time, and they were kind of suffering for money due to everyone dying in the plague recently. So in order to alleviate this, they said, hey, uh, crows are really messing up a lot of our crops, costing us a lot of coin here. I'm going to need each peasant and farmer to get uh, 12, 15 crows about. You guys are going to turn them into government officials each year, and you guys make sure that this is enforced. Fines are happening if you don't enforce it. And then secondly, it also mentions this Lithuanian poet who was in Lithuanian Minor at the time, the region the spit's in, and describes crow eating is happening among the lowest class of people. So it appears here that the deforestation that happened, the death that happened from the plague, and then the already issued edict on crow catching is really the origin of our crow eating here. You might be able to find different kinds of delicious crow and raven eggs in nests from Philadelphia to Sendai. But there's only two crows that concern our story here today. The carrion crow and the hooded crow. But really, the only crow that was caught was the hooded crow, so bye. As spring and autumn arrive, so do the crows. Migrating across the Baltic and over the lagoon to the spit during March and April and September and November. The hooded crow and most crows are scavenger birds, meaning they're going to eat whatever they can find, even if it happens to be disgusting, rotting animal flesh that's just lying out. Due to this delightful trait, no one really wants to even eat crow. And as a bonus, they also love fucking with the only crops that haven't been destroyed by the dunes that you've spent the last year working so hard on, so that's not cool. But we don't have time to worry about that here. There's tuberculosis to prevent. So, early before sunrise, the fishermen, or as they would later come to be known, crow catchers, would find a grassy area near the coast. There, they would lay out a net tossing some grass and sand over it to hide it. Then, a ripcord is run from the net to a stick hut, concealing the crow catcher. This was going to be set up in advance, making sure that all the crows flying around didn't suspect shit. Now that the crows had finally let their guard down, it was time to lay the bait. Leftover fish waste, smelt, or just whatever you had on hand would be scattered out across the net. Next, you're going to need to tie down your seductress crow that you've raised since it was a chick. If you don't have a crow, though, you can just use your black chicken, obviously. The seductress squawks treat-maxing dinner beckons to the crows flying above. On a good day, upwards of 50 to 70 would touch down and begin their feast. The crowbiter lets the cord fly, and the net snaps, trapping the birds. Only one task is left. The crow catcher brings the bird's head up to his mouth and bites, denning the skull. Now sources conflict on why exactly this was done. The Germans seem to think that it painlessly and mercifully killed the birds, while the Russians seem to suggest that this actually put them kind of in a paralyzed state so the meat doesn't spoil. The only comparable example that I could find is the guy from Duck Dynasty biting ducks, so... The crow catchers had become the crow biters. But still, the idea of sticking a living disease-ridden bird in your mouth didn't really appeal to everyone. In fact, plenty of places on the spit itself didn't even do this. They just used knives or any other normal way to kill them. 
Since you are putting your mouth hole on a bird that picks at dead, decaying flesh, disinfecting it with a swig of vodka or schnapps is going to be a really good idea. And due to this, the missus back home is going to know just how well the hunt went just by seeing how shit-faced you are. Wanting your husband to come home shit-faced so that you have food to eat has to be the most Eastern European sounding thing ever. The typical hunt would average about 15 to 20 crows a day, more if a storm forces them to fly low. The hunting season starts on September 29th, St. Michael's Day, a holiday celebrating the end of the harvest season. During autumn, crows have abundant food sources out here, and the chicks who all hatched back in May have grown to full size. One absolute beast of a crow hunter from Viente, the king of the crows, was out there posting stats like 160 crows a day. I mean, just crazy numbers. Now, some crow catchers, they would try and improve their numbers through some less savory methods, like leaving out poison mushrooms as bait. Eventually, when the crow takes the bait and starts dying, the hunter sprints over at max speed and squeezes the little bat bastard till all the poison leaves their body. Next, he would dump milk into the bird's beak until it revived, and then bite its skull. Sometimes, others would use grains soaked in vodka, hoping to get the birds as shit-faced as they were. Unfortunately for the catchers, this just gives the crows access to the joys of drunk flying, making them impossible to catch. You might be wondering right about now, why exactly would they eat crow? There has to be something else out here they can eat, right? Of course, eating only crow, that would be insane. All kinds of birds are caught out here. Like I said, fuckload of birds. Plus, they foraged just about everything they could, from eggs, frogs, herbs, to small mammals, and whatever else they could get their hands on. Now that you have your net filled with potentially paralyzed, potentially dead crows, what's there to do with them? Well, first the crows are going to be plucked, their feathers would go towards the stuffing and bedding. Then, since the crows are meant to provide for hard times, they're going to be placed in salt-filled barrels to cure and preserve and be used later. But this was a successful hunt today. You're shit-faced out here, and it's time for some fresh crow meat. So you can enjoy that either baked, boiled, fried, stewed, or cooked in just about any other way that you could cook poultry. Okay, well, there's no way that's going to be palatable, though. I mean, this is crow meat. That's disgusting, right? WRONG! Especially if it's a nice young crow. All the sources say that young crows essentially just taste like quail, and as they age, they only get a little bit tougher and develop a bit of a stewed beef-like flavor. Thankfully, the local Coronians were blessed with that hustle grind set, and they knew they could get more out of the bird as soon as the new rail to this city was built. There, the bird would be sold to high-end restaurants and inns and markets as dune chickens or goose? And it turns out the elites, they really developed a taste for crow meat, as high-end restaurants ended up having it on in their menu as spit pigeon up until about the 1940s. And how exactly is this spit pigeon prepared? Well, no one actually wanted to write down a recipe for me, so I don't really know. That one's for you, history food man. Our sources for the crow biters are really going to be sketchy up until about the 19th century. Remember all those trees that were planted about 100 years ago? Well, they've combined forces now with the dunes and the lagoon to create a beautiful and romantic landscape, unlike any other in Europe. Once again. <laughs> This, of course, attracts a bunch of pretentious artists who thankfully do have fat wads of cash to spend. A real tourism industry focused around the romanticism of the spit begins, lifting the region out of poverty. Of course, crow biting does get wrapped up in this whole idea of romanticism. The new interest brings crow biting from something done to prevent starvation, disease, and death to something that would pass the time and get all the dumb artists to just give you money. This is where all those cool old pictures that I've been showing come from. People would go out and get a demonstration from the crow biters take a picture so then they could slap it on a postcard and send it back home. But wait, is this fake news? Well, uh, maybe. Some of the pictures might kind of be staged. They're potentially the seductress ones and the kids are just biting them. But hey, even if it is fake, it doesn't really matter. A kid still got to rip off a pretentious artist, so that's a win in my book.
It was these visitors who would bestow the title of Crowbiter on the old fisherman. It was not a self-imposed name, but an insult directed at the crow catchers for their practices. But at the same time, I mean, I get it. Crowbiter sounds way cooler of a name. I mean, it's the title of the video, and also when you say it in German, Mm. By this point and early into the 20th century, we have sources that claim that only the elderly are hunting crow now. Its nostalgic taste calls to them. As the years go by, more and more crow catchers pass on and the tradition slowly fades. Some children do take part in the hunting, while others dump kerosene all over people's hunting sites so that the birds don't land because there's nothing funnier than starvation. Then afterwards, Sam would just be tossed over the area fixing the whole problem and the pranksters would be hunting down and have their shit kicked in by their grandparents. But even with a dwindling population of hunters, crow meat could still easily be found at markets throughout World War I. There were some other job opportunities as well that reduced the hunters' numbers. The site of the world's first bird observatory, the Rosatin Bird Observatory, was located on the spit. They needed plenty of help from the local natives to catch all these birds, exactly their specialty. And as a tangent, Heinrich Himmler wanted to use the Sturks observatories to spread Nazi propaganda. And speaking of Nazis, they do unfortunately come to seize the region, and when they do, they hand out a quota that limits the number of crows that can even be hunted. And Nazis ruin everything. After World War II, when the Soviet Union returned to the Baltics, the practice was sadly largely ignored and forgotten. Nowadays, the crow has lost its place on the dinner table. People don't know how to bite or don't want to bite crows anymore. There are still villages out there that partake in dune chicken. This village hosts an annual feast for the feathered creature. People from all over Lithuania and abroad actually do come to partake in the strange bushmeat, although recently public outcry has deemed the practice unfit for continuation. According to the event organizers, the raven-eating tradition is probably a thousand years older at least, further extending the unreliable origin of the practice. The organizers believe their home to be the origin point of crow consumption as the Prime Minister of Tsarist Russia, Pyotr Stolypin, started the practice in this very village. The guy though, he was only Prime Minister about a hundred years ago, so I think that they're making these numbers up now. People not from here are usually surprised by the tradition. Either they're going to be all for it or completely disgusted by the idea that people would eat such a nasty or intelligent bird. Some sources only claim that a single crow can be hunted. I cannot verify this. The act of crow biting may be dead, but the practice of crow consumption continues to this day. While most people find the act of tasting carrion eaters disgusting, there are a few who still hold on to the old ways. Dating such a practice is irrelevant. Eating crow is a reminder of overcoming hardship and surviving a changing world, be it war, culture, or terrifying sand dunes. And also, according to one saucy Eastern European lady, crow meat makes men much better at sex. But unfortunately, science is too afraid to answer the real questions that actually matter. So, there's no proof of this for now. Donate to the Archive today so that we may end our pledge drive early and can finally afford Lithuanian translators 